Hello, today I'm going to be looking at stove tiles and we'll look at what um, ceramic stoves were like uh, when they were in fashion and then we'll look at some actual examples which I've found on the Thames foreshore over the years. Um, I've been mudlarking off and on for over 10 years and I've only found eight pieces of ceramic stove tile um, and these have been among my best finds. Um, so what exactly is a ceramic stove and what do these tiles which made up these stoves actually look like when they were in situ, when they were new? Um, well to answer this uh, it's probably better to have a look at some examples in situ. Um, here's an example from a castle in Germany which was uh, basically warmed up Martin Luther while he was writing his version of the Bible. So a ceramic stove is basically a large wall-mounted stove made up of individual ceramic tiles. Um, it's very large, um, as you can see it's fitted into the room, it's not something you buy off the shelf, but it is something which is actually built into the wall because normally the stove is on one side of the wall and the stoke hole where you actually put in your wood or maybe even your coal perhaps uh, is on a separate room on the other side of the wall so you have to stoke it from outside and then the warmth uh, comes through the ceramic tiles um, into the room. Um, here's another couple of examples And here's an example from a medieval manuscript of one in a contemporary setting. So as you can imagine, uh, things like this were very high status. Um, they're very large and expensive bits of kit that you have to basically uh, build into your house, into your room. Um, so we only find them in very high status settings. So in London um, they are really only found in palaces and monasteries and a little bit later in merchants houses, very rich merchant houses. These style of ceramic stoves um, began life in the continent um, and never became very popular in the UK um, here in Britain. Um, they started to be made in the 15th century uh, and became quite widespread about 1475 and continued on to about 1535-1550. So they're found in monasteries before the dissolution of the monasteries in the 15, late 1530s. Um, and examples have been excavated in London. Um, parts of a stove tile have been found at the monastery of St Mary Graces. Um, and this would be dated to before 1538 when the monastery was um, closed down by the authorities and dissolved, as you like, dissolution of the monasteries. Um, and as I said, after this time they were popular in rich merchants' houses as well. Um, so they're always um, very high status finds and pretty uncommon, to be honest. Um, the monastery only had one stove tile. Um, so what form did they take? Well we can see from the photograph um, that they're very tall and they're often very architectural and due to the time period in which they were made they're obviously very gothic in style so we get these architectural style tiles um, which are very gothic in appearance. Um, they were made of earthenware um, from separate tiles which are built up you have large tiles and you have thin tiles which are spacers um, and they were made up into these large ovens or stoves. Um, here's a picture of some of the stove tile fragments which were found in London at St Mary Grace's. And here's some pictures of um, the oven that they were basically uh, the reconstruction of the stove uh, which they, um, when they were put together, this is 
how they would have looked. Um, some of these tiles were tin glazed and some of them were lead glazed. Um, so you find both sorts. Um, a lot of the tiles were made abroad and a lot of the stove tiles would have had to be imported um, and then built into your building. A lot of them were fired in Aachen in Germany. Um, but there were also um, kilns and industries in this country which produced stove tiles. The Surrey Hampshire border industry produced stove tiles in the 16th century. And it's likely that the stove tiles which have a royal crest, a Tudor crest, on them were produced in this country. Um, let's have a look now at some of the examples which I found on the Thames foreshore. Um, here's an obvious chunk. You can see that it's from a large hollow brick or tile, uh, earthenware with one face glazed, and also rather distinctive is this keying pattern there, which where the mortar would have been keyed in to take the next tile in the stack. Um, here's another fragment which I found. Um, as well as being lead glazed or tin glazed, they're recognisable by the very high relief um, of the modelling and also that they're highly decorated quite often. That's the head of a griffin, which we'll come to later. Um, there's another couple of corners. So that's a corner there. You can see the remains of some decoration. Um, but again, you can tell at once that it's from a boxed hollow brick tile there, presumably hollow so that the air would heat up inside them and help to radiate some of the heat. There's another corner there, also lead glazed. Also, you can see on both edges you've got the keying for the mortar, which is quite a diagnostic feature of these tiles there on that one. And there on at least two sides you've got those keying strips there. Um, here's one which was probably made in Aachen, and it's a thin spacer tile. Um, that is the end of it there, and it's like a little column of twisted rope or... Uh, string I suppose and that's yellow glazed uh, but again on red earthenware there so that would go on between the larger courses of tiles. Um, these are particularly interesting fragments there and there with this animal head on it. Um, this is a griffin and this would be basically the right-hand side of the Tudor coat of arms. Um, now, interestingly enough, on one of the mudlarking sites on Facebook, someone found a larger fragment of this. Uh, and I've got a copy of it, so here I've, I didn't have a note of who the finder was, unfortunately. Um, but do get in touch if it's you. Um, and it, you can see it's from the same tile, but as well as the head, he has more of the body of the griffin on this fragment, so I'll just show you that picture. But basically this is from the Tudor coat of arms. Um, we're used to, in our coat of arms, the modern royal coat of arms having the lion and the unicorn as the um, animals which hold up your coat of arms, the retainers, the retaining animals. But in Tudor times, the Tudor coat of arms from Henry VII to Elizabeth I, from 1487 to 1603, uh, had a lion and a griffin. And this is the head of a griffin. So this is the right-hand side of the Tudor coat of arms. And you can see on this one there, you can see the edge of a crown also from the top of the arms there. Um, and you also get stove tiles. Here's some smaller fragments of stove tiles. Uh, with the Tudor rose and the royal initials. Uh, so there's a Tudor rose and there's an R, so that'd be the right hand side. It'd either be Rex, H.R. Henricus Rex for King Henry, or um, Elizabeth Regina 
uh, Queen Elizabeth, so that'd be a bit later. Um, and here's another one which just has an H on it for Henry. <clears throat> and the, the final fragment I found uh, is just a nicely, oops, it help if I had the right word, a nicely decorated piece of stove tile with a picture of a duck on it, so it's not a royal coat of arms, uh, but just a decorated piece. So, um, interesting to note uh, that the ones with the Tudor rose on it and also the initial H are white clay on the face where it was glazed and moulded uh, but the back is red clay, so you've got a sandwich of red clay and white clay and that's another quite distinctive feature of these stove tiles there and the same with that, you can just see a fragment of the red clay on the back of the tile but the front is all white clay where the glaze, the lead glaze and the moulding is found on those. Um, and to a lesser extent on the larger fragments which I have found here, um, you can see obviously red clay in the background, then there's a very thin strip of white, probably like a slip, uh, and then the lead glaze is glazed on top of that. So you can get an idea, if you find uh, fragments like that, uh, hollow brick fragments with glazing on one side or one face, uh, with very high moulding, very deep detailed moulding and those uh, obvious giveaway little keying sections on one or two sides there, then you've probably found a bit of stove tile. Um, and they're nice to find because as I said they're not common, they're very high status things that come from palaces and monasteries and very rich merchants houses. Um, so I've always been very happy when I've picked up pieces um, and anything obviously from the 16th century which shows a royal crest or the Tudor coat of arms um, is definitely a good find in my book. So I hope that's explained a bit about stove tiles, uh, the sort of furniture they came from and how to recognise fragments you might find on the foreshore. So happy hunting and thank you for watching. Bye.